OK, so transcription and recording has started. So it's just going to be a quick overview of kind of basic presentation skills. So how to structure a PowerPoint and then how to deliver the presentation, because obviously just constructing a PowerPoint is only one part of it. Um, so everyone knows what that is, yeah? Can anyone answer the question? What is that? I think it looks like a classroom. <laughs> Not a trick question. It certainly is a classroom, yeah? Um, so I'm going to pose a question. If you look at this classroom in the classroom just before, would you say that they are suitable environments for learning? Yeah. Yeah. OK, what is suitable about them? It's quite um, it's quite colourful and there's a lot of things on the walls, which kind of makes it a bit easier for the children. Because if it's quite like bland and stuff, it's a bit it's a bit more boring for them. So uh -huh. they're walking into a classroom that's really bright and colourful. Thank you very much. Excellent. Right. So there, what you've just said is actually grounded in science, but from the 1960s. So they conducted a study and what they found was if there's a deprivation of stimulation, as you just said, if they walk into a very boring environment, the children, then there are less connections between brain neurons. So their conclusion was that humans needed enriched environments. So if a child walks into a colourful classroom, it's an enriched environment and therefore uh, more connections between neurons can be established. OK, does that make sense? Yeah. Cool. One problem with it. The experiment wasn't with humans. It was with rats. So what they did was they took a rat, they put it in a box with nothing in the box, and then they put loads of things in the box to stimulate the rat. And the neurons started to, sh to shine and whatever those images show you, the kind of brain images that show you the flashing lights. We're not quite sure what they are, but all it showed was there were more connections within the neurons. The issue with this being you can kind of overkill the brain. You can give it too much information. So this is a learning environment in Finland, one of the best education systems in the world. If you compare and contrast this with the psychedelic classroom of insanity, which of these would you prefer to learn in? This environment or this environment? I think it depends on the age group, like maybe reception year one children would prefer that kind of classroom environment. Whereas if you're maybe, maybe our kind of age and stuff where it's not that colourful, all you really want to do is like properly learn, maybe that will be a better environment for them. So the sweet spot in the middle, essentially. Jade, yeah. you're on as well. What do you think? Um, I was just going to say, in the early years, they're making everything more neutral colours. They're using like hessian on backdrops and natural materials for toys instead of bright, colourful plastic because of the overstimulation. Yes, and this is excellent to do with this, the DMN, the default mode network, which is like the resting state of the brain. Yeah. So this is when you're not doing anything. There's no external stimuli. Essentially, when you're daydreaming. So this is the kind of the, the low frequency fluctuations of the brain. And already this is using between 60 to 80 percent of your brain energy. So if you relate this to an academic presentation, your audience's brain is already functioning between 60 to 80 percent. It's using that much energy. So you haven't got much to play with. So if your slides are like the psychedelic classroom of insanity, you're going to lose your audience. That's the kind of point in this presentation is you need to choose and select key information only and present it on the slides. Information overkill, the overkill backfire effect is kind of an, a, another element of this argument, whereby if you give people too much information, they essentially walk away with nothing. And as Jade said, they, there are changes within the early years. Now, we are heavily influenced by Finland. Um, you've also kind of got the Montessori approach. You've got Steiner schools where everything is kind of stripped back from this. The colours are very engaging for students. But don't forget, you're not taking one individual student and putting them in this colourful room with palm trees. You're taking 20 plus of them and putting them in there. So already there's so much stimulation in the room. How can the brain concentrate on learning is the key question. So if you relate this to presentations, and that's Sir Ken Robinson, sadly no longer with us, 
but one of the kind of most influential British educationalists. And if you've ever watched his TED talk, he's extremely engaging, very clear and very informative. Um, and what he said was to consider that a presentation is a conversation. It's a one sided conversation. So it's not reading information. It's not just listing information. It's engaging an audience. So I'll go through the, the key parts of a presentation now. And please don't feel like I'm talking down to you in any way, shape or form. I'm just going to kind of tick the boxes as I go through. So three fundamental parts. So an introduction. So what exactly are you going to tell people? You should establish this early on to engage the audience, also known as a hook. So the reason I used the images of the classrooms was if I just start with this slide, it's relatively boring. Um, there's no reason for you to really engage with what I'm saying. You'll just be daydreaming off in the distance, as we've already established. That's going on anyway. So somehow I need to engage you. So these are the three simple kind of structural elements to a presentation. Introduction, what are you going to tell people? The main body, you then tell them. And the conclusion, a brief summary of your key points and establish exactly what you just told people. So it should be kind of a cycle. You should start with what you're going to say, say it all, and then establish what you said. Those three main parts need to be there. Um, and that is just the base structure of a presentation. And you should establish a purpose. So what are you looking to do here? What is your central question or questions? So for example, when we looked at ed inequality, you were given groups. So it could be Gypsy Roma travelers. It could have been children looked after um, or looked after children. But the best presentations there established a key theme or a central question. They looked at a, an element of this group and focused on that rather than just kind of broadly establishing that you had a base knowledge. It was really engaging in a particular theme to evidence understanding and then critical analysis throughout. So the questions are very important. Is a presentation and an assignment are similar and very different. Um, you need to explicitly state what you are going to do within the introduction to the presentation. This is similar to what you would do within an assignment, but obviously you don't have the kind of the language use that you would have within a, a 2000 word written assignment. Um, within a presentation, you need to consider that your audience is listening to you, but also looking at a slide. I'll go into that a little bit later. The other thing to consider, how will it be assessed? So make sure uh, your questions do relate to the marking criteria. Uh, the marking criteria will be assigned specific uh, marks. So it could be 10 marks for an introduction, 20 marks uh, for analysis, 20 marks for a comparative study. You need to just make sure that you're assigning enough time to each of those elements to make sure that you're kind of ticking off the marking criteria as you work your way through the presentation then you can add the kind of value added element to your presentation, the individual element. But just make sure that there's clarity between uh, the assessment marking criteria and what you are going to do within the presentation to make sure that you're not focusing kind of 10 minutes of your 20 minute presentation um, on an element of the criteria that is only assigned 10 marks. So kind of working out mathematically which elements you should be focusing on and assign timing to that. And then you will know that you need to focus on these specific elements for a, a particular amount of time. Uh, the one thing you need to always consider as well, have you covered all of the essential information? Are there any questions arising within your presentation um, that you haven't addressed, that you haven't answered? That's why it's very important to kind of draft a presentation. It's, it's good practice to draft it on paper and then shift it over to PowerPoint. If you start fiddling with PowerPoint straight away, um, you can spend hours just looking at the design and picking your font and put, putting pictures in there. Uh, and none of this is really addressing a marking criteria. This is just kind of the bells and whistles that people add to a presentation to try to distract from the lack of information. Preparation. So, same as you would do with an assignment, write your main argument and conclusion because that's your starting point and your ending point. You then need to populate the main body. The main body should be populated with bullet points, as you'll note here. They're not long paragraphs. Um, there's any, hardly any punctuation whatsoever, because I want you to listen to me. 
it is impossible for you to read and listen at the same time. Clear opening and clear closing. Presentations that kind of um, they don't achieve as well as, as they should do is there's not really any clarity on where it was going. It just begins and it ends. Um, there's no real central question. There's no clear focus. Um, so you need to just establish exactly what the purpose of this presentation is and then address this question at the end of the presentation. Did you achieve your goal? Did you answer the question? If not, what would you look into next? But remember, we're constantly looking for critical analysis here, and that's not only of other people's work, but also of your own work. And focus on the main point and central question. Don't get distracted by trying to evidence just knowledge, how much information you know. It's much more important that you engage in analysis and evaluation and you evidence understanding of the topic. Right, some things to never, ever, ever do. Use paragraphs or long sentences on the screen. This can be really distracting. Your audience will begin to read. Um, also, this normally means that you are reading. Um, the audience will therefore not be listening to you. They will note any mistakes you make. Uh, they'll also note any spelling errors. Punctuation can be distracting. Um, and some people do have issues with pronunciation of certain words or certain terms. And if these are on the slide and you get them wrong, the audience in the market will know about this. Uh, over punctuation. So I'm not even using full stops on these slides. Um, there shouldn't be commas. The only thing you would ever probably use are quotation marks if you're going to use a quote. Um, and never use complex diagrams unless they are essential for your presentation. Um, these can be really distracting for, for, for the audience. So even while you're maybe explaining the diagram, um, the audience is kind of shut down from the overkill back for effect where they're looking at this complicated diagram um, and attempting to understand it. So just be very aware of the information within the presentation. It should all be usable. Like I've seen presentations before where it would be a slide discussing some issue within education, and then there's just a random picture of a child in the corner. Um, there's no purpose to this picture. It, it doesn't really relate to the discussion. They just decided to put a picture of a child in there because you're on a primary ed degree. Um, remember that we're trying to get you to function as, you know, at level five, you, you know, you're getting ready to go into level six now. It's term two. Um, so just treat the presentations um, as if they're a professional presentation. Now. So it's academia, but also it's getting you used to being able to kind of transmit key information orally, not just in written form. So this is an example or I'll go into an example in a second, um, from a level five student a couple of years ago. So I've anonymized it, um, but I'll just take you through the kind of look and feel of the presentation. But before I do that, any questions? No. No. <laughs> Is everyone following? Yeah. 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 Cool. That's the main question. Not that you could say no to that anyway. It's a bit of a redundant question, isn't it? Right. So this is an example from a couple of years ago. I'm obviously not going to present it because it wasn't my presentation. But I'll walk you through slide by slide and just see how much information you come away with uh, and note the kind of structure of the slides here. So that's the opening slide. Slide number two. OK, everybody finished reading? Yeah. Yeah? OK. So, yeah. so what would you say? Too much information on the slide or just just about right? I still say too much. Just a little too much, isn't it? Yeah. Was it hard to follow? I had to read it a couple of times. Yeah. But it is also a relatively complicated subject, yeah? Yeah. So it's something you might not have read about before. But something that 
it's kind of tough to establish the sweet spot here. I would say, yeah, you could reduce this down slightly more. So the next slide. So this is looking at brain architecture within neuroscience. So this, I would say, is the perfect amount of words on a slide. A note here, there's synthesis of sources at the bottom. There's only key terms established on the slide and everything is supported by credible sources. But obviously, during the oral presentation element, all of this was developed upon. So the only thing that was on the slide are the key terms that the audience needs to understand whilst the presentation is being delivered. OK, so now looking at the. The kind of the anatomy of the brain, so something very, very complicated brain anatomy, um, and I think the student did an excellent job here of dividing the slide into three elements. So you could look at them individually and using an image to kind of establish how this works together. So note here that the image adds to the discussion. It is kind of the central component part of the discussion, really. And again, synthesis of sources, uh, in-text citations, credible sources as well. So you'll notice here, there aren't any websites. There's no grey literature here. There are no newspapers. There's the OECD, Kumar and Reid. So, as part of this presentation, the students had to select a neuromyth and then debunk the neuromyth, so prove that it was wrong. So this slide was extremely important. And here the student talked around the need to debunk a neuromyth and how to do it. So that was the only thing that showed up on the slide for this part. And this was the neuromyth. So a primary indicator of dyslexia is seeing letters backwards. That's not true, by the way. So what they did then was they established what is fact. And yet again, this slide kind of just the right amount of information here. But no, there's not fully formed sentences here. There, are, there isn't punctuation, there's bullet points. It's a minor mistake here. This should have had quotation marks around it if it's a quote because the page is given. But other than that, it's a really clear and accessible slide. So when she did this slide, did she just read it or did she go into detail about the bullet points? Is it, the, the bullet points are just the headers. So that's your kind of your opening topic sentence and then you go into detail. Okay. So it's the same um, as you've probably seen it with uh, lectures where there'll be five kind of key points on a slide and the lecturer might speak for 10 to 15 minutes about them. So it's only just to kind of, it's a bit of a roadmap of what you're talking about. So the audience knows what's coming next, but then they're able to listen to you rather than read. And then that the discussion around dyslexia was then related to education. So you could see how these headers would start a discussion. It's kind of prompting your brain to start thinking about what is the presenter going to say, and then you can begin to listen. That's all the slide is meant to do is engage you. A presentation is called a presentation because it's oral. You're meant to present information. OK, done. So that's a 20 minute presentation. Did it seem like too little, too much or just enough? It seemed like very little information, but it, did, it depends how much you have to say about that, the certain key points, because you could have one key point at, like on that PowerPoint, but you could say something about it for like five, ten minutes. 
Yes, which then evidence is understanding, yes? Yeah. Rather than you've got it all on the slide and you read it out, mm. which means you might be very good at um, copy and paste and you might be very good at reading. But the main thing to, to realise here is you're presenting to a marker and to the audience, not to yourself. So, Afsana, yes? Oh, no, I was going to say the exact thing. It, it depends on what's said orally. Um per each via each point but you can see the complexity of some of the information here yeah you can, need to be talked about yes exactly you're kind of getting people to like neurobiological in origin most people will start listening then like there's complexity to some of the, the key terms that are on here they're there for a reason they're there because also you want to feed the marker the marker needs to know that you understand this. So by having those key points, they can listen to you and then refer back and go, OK, they did talk about it being a, a ling linguistic problem. But it's more the fact that they're not fully formed sentences is the main thing I want you to understand. The difference between an, a written assignment and just kind of a, a presentation where you're establishing key terms that you're then going to discuss. Right. OK, so what was the main focus of that presentation? The myths of brain um, assumption, uh, assumptions in, through education or in education. Yeah. How the brain works. And what was the particular focus within it? Is it the misconceptions of how how the how the brain works? Exactly. That's exactly what it was about. Yeah, it was about neuro myths. So the fact that some things are believed to be true um, and quite you know, commonly believed to be true, that are simply we found um, through kind of contemporary neuroscience that they, it's just not right. And it's going back to the psychedelic classroom. The crazy colourful classroom, this was established many years ago. And we know that this is not right now. We know that there are high numbers of children with ADHD um, and, and there are increasing amounts of children with ADHD, um, but we send them into a psychedelic classroom with 30 other children and expect them to concentrate and learn. So we know that that's not true. So it's the same with your presentations is you won't know that what you're doing is wrong unless someone kind of just clearly shows you this is how to set up a presentation. This is how much information you can give in written form because the human brain cannot receive information at the same time through both receptive skills. So if you are reading and listening, your brain cannot cope with both of those kind of receiving skills. If the information is complex, it's simply not possible for you to do it. So you've got to pick one. Is the audience reading or are they listening? Right. Anyone remember a key point from the presentation? I was going to say the myth about how words are seen backwards um, with uh, dyslexia. Excuse me while I throw my hands in the air and celebrate. That was the entire purpose of um, the presentation was to debunk that myth. It was for you to walk away going, OK, I know that that's not true. So it's called creating the gap. So the entire purpose of that presentation was that point to build up to establishing that that claim is untrue and then fill in the gap with information. So as long as the gap has been created, you can then establish what is true. So it's the same with what I'm attempting to do today, which is to get you to understand that even though it's kind of a level of security with having lots of information on a slide, um, it's something that you're going to have to kind of walk away from and realise that there, there are certain ways to design a presentation um, that are engaging for the audience and for the marker. So preparation. Never use animations, pointless pictures, um, things that are, you're not going to kind of refer to within the presentation. If there is no purpose for them being there, don't put them there. And the other thing, I'll say it and keep saying it, don't read from the slides because the audience can read that. You can introduce the points, but the oral aspect, 
should develop understanding, you should develop upon those points. So never do things like this. I've seen some horrendous presentations before where everything comes flying in and dancing around. It's a presentation at university level, so just remember that. So this is kind of now focusing on the oral aspect of it. So we look at uh, what you should be saying as you move through. Obviously, this can't be topic specific, but I can give you a, a, a kind of base understanding of the fundamentals. So the same as you would start an assignment, you should signpost. So where are we now? How long will it take? It's always quite handy to say my presentation will be around 18 minutes long. Um, so we're looking at neuroscience and what I'm going to do within this presentation is look at brain architecture and then discuss some neuro myths that are commonly had. As all you're doing is intro introducing your presentation and it's this, exactly the same as an introductory paragraph in an assignment, you should signpost what you are going to do to allow the reader to understand that there is a central question and a main focus and these are the key themes that you're going to focus on to establish your kind of conclusion and main point. So transitioning, this is the bit that can feel rather uncomfortable when you first do it, um, but it is really helpful for the audience and for the marker. So I'm sure, you know, the first time you do presentations, you can get quite nervous and just click your way through them as quickly as you possibly can, rather than transitioning between slides and between discussions. So using this kind of language, it also gives you a little bit of a breather before you move on to your next point. So things like, let me move on to, next, first, second, third. Finally, we, we kind of know, however basic this, this seems, is really helpful for the audience and it establishes a clear structure to your presentation. So clarity and language use. There are, the is kind of a way of delivering an oral presentation um, that can engage an audience um, and it can see, seem like you are actually talking to them rather than you were just presenting. There is a bit of a difference there. Like a lecture is, all, all a lecture is doing is presenting you with information that you need to receive. There's not really that much of an engagement there. Obviously things have changed over time, um, but you're looking to engage an audience within a presentation, within your key theme or key topic, and to engage them in your discussion and debate. So the use of reporting verbs, if you haven't really focused on reporting verbs yet, and this is something sometimes first language students um, don't really note. Um, if you want a bank of reporting verbs, send me an email, I can send you through kind of um, a sheet which has got all of the different reporting verbs that can be used in academic writing. But these are helpful because then the audience knows exactly the kind of points you're looking to establish. Right, some little kind of hints and tips on the oral aspect. So keywords should be clearly identified. Um, and you emphasize these on the slide and also through speech. Um, so your intonation, stress the keywords. Um, obviously, you can change speed, you can change tone, um, and all of this continues to engage the audience rather than you're extremely monotone and just talk your way through the presentation and it doesn't really seem like you're at all interested in what you're saying. Obviously, you guys are on a primary ed degree and you're hoping to become teachers and it's all about engaging students and you'll know this from being in primary classrooms your voice is extremely important in a classroom and if you've made a very important and very clever point and you're very proud of yourself pause after it so the marker notes it and the audience notes it as well if you just give your really important point and then go on to the next point everyone might miss it so just think about that is the kind of written aspect of the presentation is one part um, that shouldn't take you that long. The research will take time, but just kind of taking those key terms and populating a PowerPoint slide so it's nice and clear and accessible. But then it's kind of focusing on the oral delivery. You can have notes. That's not a problem. But you just don't want to be reading from them. Right. Framing beginnings and endings. So. These seem like really basic terms, but they're really helpful in a presentation. Um, if you're looking at two sides to an argument, now let's consider the other side of this argument. These little kind of transitions and frames 
uh, helpful for the audience. They're comfortable. They, they've they heard these before. They now know what you're going to do. And they also add a kind of a, a professional element to your presentation. Highlighting key points, as I said before, make sure if you if you're making a, a very intelligent argument, if this is your main focus, so make sure the audience understands this and the marker understands it. Don't just present the information, frame it. Um, and that's for written, written work and presentations. But just make sure these seem like really basic things, but they add value to your presentation. All right, conclusions and summaries. So when you get to your final slide, um, what you want to do here is establish your key points and summarize your main arguments. This is kind of identifying that you understand the roadmap of your presentation. So you've introduced your presentation, could be the one we looked at on neuroscience. Um, you looked at brain architecture, then you looked at some of the myths surrounding dyslexia. So you would summarize your key points just to establish again to the marker in the audience what the purpose of your presentation was. So just briefly review your presentation, clarify your stance if there's an argument, and don't present any new information within a summary. Sometimes you can use the content slide, the kind of introduction to your presentation, the roadmap, the signposting of your presentation. You can use that again as the conclusion uh, because it will show that you've kind of closed the loop of the presentation. You've told them what you're going to tell them, you've told them, and then you repeat the key points just to kind of establish that the presentation has gone from the introduction to the conclusion. It also sets you up quite well uh, for any questioning because you've re-established your key points. All right. Some issues with ineffective presentations. All right. OK, anyone give me an element of an ineffective presentation, something that's bad practice in a presentation? Spelling mistakes, grammar. Yeah, spelling mistakes, grammar. Anything else? Jade, anything that's a, an element of a bad presentation? Do you mean stuff that you've listed already or something new? Either. Stuff uh, I've listed. <laughs> reading off the slides. Yeah, reading off the slides. Amy, anything else? That just bad you shouldn't do it in a presentation um like you said like a robot voice like you know you, you need to actually sound like you're interested yourself in your own presentation because if you're not interested then the audience aren't going to be interested at all either yes anything else what about putting too much information on there yes they're, they're the kind of the, the key the, the key elements I want you to take away from this. Don't put too much information on the slide. Don't read from the slides and don't sound like you're bored. Because all three and everyone knows I know I've done presentations in the past. Um, too much information. I didn't really know what I was talking about and I wasn't that interested in what I was saying. But it is remember that you're presenting your work to a market, so you want to frame it and present it as best as you can. Yes, ineffective presentations, too much detail, reading from slides, and consider the visual impact of your slides. The one thing you'll note with that neuro myths, uh, neuroscience presentation, the slides are really well designed. It looks professional, and the slides suit the presentation well. And this is the key one, the audience's receptive skills. So we have receptive and productive skills, yeah? Your productive skills are speaking and writing. Your receptive skills are listening and reading. The audience cannot listen and read at the same time. So if you put a slide up and all the audience is reading and then you start talking, you've already lost the audience. They're going to be confused. So there's nothing wrong with going bullet point, discuss, bullet point, discuss, rather than putting all your bullet points on a slide and then trying to discuss them all while the audience is trying to read all the information on the slide. So maintain control of your presentation as well. You are presenting the information. And don't forget your in-text citations 
and you don't need to list all of these when you're presenting yeah that can be quite distracting and obviously if you're going to use a synthesis of sources and you've got a range of different sources supporting your argument you might waste the majority of your presentation listing the authors and theorists that you're referring to all right effective presentations timing on time and not rushed or drawn out there's nothing worse than someone's trying to do the the 20 minute presentation and you know that they're doing those final kind of two slides really really slowly just to hit the time or they get to the final slide and they have to rush really quickly just to hit time timing is important um so that's where as i said before if you take the marking rubric you look at the percentage of the marks that are assigned to different component parts of the presentation and then you kind of relate that to the time so how much time should i be spending on this obviously an introduction should be much smaller than any kind of comparative analytical discussion more time would be spent on that right interactive elements so you don't necessarily need to have a game or a kahoot or anything but you can pose questions to the audience um, make sure they're answered, of course. You don't want any rhetorical mechanisms. Um, but CCQ, so these are concept checking questions. So, for example, in the uh, neuroscience, neuromyths presentation, the CCQs, the concepts being, do people understand neuroscience and do they understand what neuromyths are? So you'd establish that as you went through. Um, so just make sure that there are, there are elements of your presentation that engage the audience interaction is great if you have time within the presentation and where you can get the audience to kind of undertake an activity that consolidates understanding and learning that's great but it's not always within academic presentations so sometimes it's helpful and as i said before focus and establish your main question that's interactive you're posing a question to the audience so you're already engaging their brain and getting them to think about your topic um, and make sure it's accessible and accessible to all within the audience. Like you don't want 15 random pictures of children. It's simply not needed. Um, consider the site, and this was another thing I noted in some of the presentations previously, because of the amount of information that was put on the slide, the font size was really small. So it was quite complicated um, to kind of read and to follow. Um, and what you're looking to do here is evidence, understanding and analysis. So as you'll note in the presentation um, that I use as an example here, the neuroscience presentation, the key terms are on the slide. But as you said, they had to discuss these terms. They had to expand on these terms to evidence, understanding and analysis. And that's kind of level five to level six is the focus is, do you understand that there are multiple perspectives surrounding a topic, not just one perspective? And can you analyze these perspectives? But I'm done. Any questions? And I'll stop recording, then you can ask any questions you want.